Our next speaker is Josh Adams. Josh Adams is a friend. I got to know him over a decade ago. I visited the farms that he's managed. He's visited our ranch. He, you think about um, regenerative and he embodies, it's not an oxymoron to be a regenerative forage producer. Like many people think, and they have the the context or the connotation, the mindset that if we're going to grow crops, it is degenerative. And generally it is, but it really depends on how you do it. And what I've seen as I've watched Josh is that he's able to grow high quality with high yields and build soil. And he's got a unique way to be able to do that. So when it comes to building a legacy business, as we mentioned yesterday, we can't continue to degenerate the soil and disregard the life that God has given us to steward, which is beneath our feet and want to build a legacy business. So Josh, are you there? Are you keyed up? You ready? Yeah, we're ready. Awesome. Very good. So you are co-host. You can go ahead and share the screen whenever you're ready and welcome. Welcome to the summit, Josh. It's a privilege to have you here. All right. Appreciate it. Um, let me make sure that this works. Um, we're sharing our screen. Do you guys see what I see? Yeah, we can see Zoom. Is that the right? Okay, just right. Okay. So, airplane? Yes, sir. All right, really good. So, hello, everybody. I'm Josh Adams. Uh, I have a pretty unique agricultural story. Uh, it started out when I was 25 years old. I decided, based on my experiences in eastern Oregon, of working on farms and ranches that I wanted to participate in agriculture, I caught the bug, but I had had very little knowledge of it, very little understanding. Uh, my family wasn't involved in agriculture for two generations, and uh, but I was a bit of a risk taker, and I wasn't scared to try new things and to to fall on my face, and that's usually the the best way that I learn. And so at uh, a young age, uh, I bought a farm in Idaho, uh, had no family connection there, Had it was just brand new. The farm was quite beat up. It was degenerated. The systems, the irrigation systems were poor. And uh, I just, uh, we, we figured out a way to buy it and we jumped on it as a young kid and we just started from scratch. And my advice always came from the neighbors and from things I'd read, uh, you know, listen, uh, listen to various uh, advice from uh, farmers that had been doing it the same way forever. And I just mimicked them until one day. And that day was this day right here. Uh, this was the exact spray plane that flew over my farm. And what he's laying down is a, a compound that melts the cytoskeleton on alfalfa weevils. And the reason I needed that, I used to I used to leave and and uh, pursue other other things when I was young and I'd I'd uh, set my irrigation up and I'd leave for a couple of days and I'd come back and and jump back on the farm and uh, it was kind of a chaotic lifestyle at that time, but I came back and, and I noticed one of my alfalfa fields that was about eight inches tall at the time was just down to the dirt. And I thought, well, that's strange. And I drove up and I looked and my entire, my entire field up on the hill was completely decimated by alfalfa weevil. And so what do you do when you get inundated with an insect or a problem? You, you kill it, you spray it. And so I called frantically, called the the airplane and said, "Hey, I have an infestation. Uh, things are things are going upside down here. I'm I'm the victim of this terrible uh, attack." And so I hired this this spray plane, and we put this uh, this chemical poison in this airplane. And uh, seven o'clock this morning, he came and he flew directly over over our fields on the whole farm. It was an 800 acre farm. And this was the, the third or fourth pass. And right now this picture, I took this picture and I'm standing in my front yard, the front yard of my house. And as, as any respectable land steward does, he wants to make sure everything's being done right. And so I watched this plane apply this 
this product and it was a beautiful morning. The sun was out as you can see. And uh, when he came and made this pass, this particular pass over my, over my field that abutted my house and my yard, there was a little puff of wind as that spray settled slowly down on that alfalfa and it puffed over and it settled right down at my feet where I was standing in my front yard. And then I smelled it and it offended my senses. And I just thought, man, something, something triggered in my mind right then. I wanted to get away from it. I wanted to move away. And then I realized my two-year-old daughter at the time would be playing later on that day on that same grass. And instantly I got hit as with a ton of bricks and thought something, something's wrong with this. I'm producing forage that will eventually become food, yet I'm applying something that is obviously tox toxic and offends my senses. Something's wrong. And so that was the day that, that my journey actually really started. Um, I began to experiment, dive deep, figure out what in the world was going on. Why was I such a victim of this attack? And so I would stay up late and I would read articles and I would, I would make experiments and I had full authority on this farm to do whatever I needed to do. And, uh, and I learned and I messed up and I learned and I messed up and I, 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 I did different practices, different tillage practices, different planting practices. And then nothing ever seemed to, to change until another uh, transformational day came. If you see in this picture beyond, there's some, some hills in the background. And so one day I jumped out of my tractor and I walked across the field that you see there. And I was just confused. I was so, so confused because as I walked across the farm ground, as I stepped on it, it was hard. It was hard as concrete. And it, it was growing weeds. There was weeds uh, that were popping up right and left. And my crops were struggling a little bit. The plants didn't look very good. They looked kind of sick. And it was frustrating to me that here I am putting all this time and energy and money into this farm. And the soil was just did not look good. It didn't look healthy. It looked like all the neighbors looked, but it still didn't provide me any solace. It was it was challenging. And so I had to just I had to take a break. I borrowed a soil probe from my neighbor and I I I stood on it and I couldn't even get it to go on the ground on my farm fields. And so then I just took a walk up into those hills that you see there, that are above us. And I walked and walked and walked and it was interesting. There's no cattle leases on this property. All there are is huge herds of elk and deer that, uh, that frequent those hills. And so I thought, okay, so what I'm seeing here is vastly different than what I'm seeing on my farm fields. I would see multi-species. I, I took my soil probe that I couldn't even get in the ground on the farm that I was working and I stood on it. And before I could even get any weight on it, it slid clear down to, to its limit. And I pulled it up and I saw rich, deep, dark uh, topsoil. And I thought, this is interesting. And and I looked around and I thought, the only the only manager here is what I'm going to call on this summit is the God of nature. That's the steward up here. The God of nature, nobody else touches this property. It hadn't been leased for, for rent to, to ranch for a long time. And it would just fallow ground that the elk manage, basically. And I thought, how in the world can I produce or provide no energy to this property up here? And it looks healthy to me. There's no bug holes in any of the leaves up here. There's no there's no soil that when I when I dig in it with my hands breaks my fingernails off it I can reach in and I can pull it apart and it smells humusy it's dark it's beautiful and it's it's healthy it's it's the first time uh, that that light bulb really popped off and here I am spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and hundreds and hundreds of hours. Uh, I think at that period of my career, I was working 110 hour weeks. I didn't sleep much. We, all, I was trying to figure this out. 
And what I realized was the God of nature was doing it better than I was. And I was putting zero energy up there and I was putting all my energy down below and I was screwing it up. Flat out, I was screwing it up. Now, with uh, with crop insurance programs and with a lot of equipment and with chemistry solutions, then you can you can you can force a crop out of the ground. You can force activity. You can depress the weeds. You can depress the insects. You can do all of those things, but it's like chemistry problems and chemistry solutions. But what I started to realize is that we don't live in a sole 100% chemistry world. We're actually and truly biological beings, and we're living in this biological, ecological earth. And chemistry is just part of it. But in commercial and production agriculture all over the, the nation and world, that is the focus. And I started to wonder why. And so I would attend summits and conferences and I would read textbooks and I'd stay up late into the night studying abstracts that were written by different universities. And God bless these people. I mean, they're doing the best they can with what knowledge they understand as academics. But that's not always the answer. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe I can't lean heavily on the academics. Maybe I need to just study the God of nature, what he's doing up on my hill ground right there. I own that ground above my farm fields. I need to study how he's doing it and then use technology because I believe technology is very, very efficient and effective and see if I can mimic what he does. Okay, so then it so then it began. And so what, what started happening is I would, I would uh, go from one thing to the other, and then I'd start experimenting on my ground using that frame of reference. Okay, what would the God of nature do in this situation? Why would the God of nature send bugs right now? It, was, it sounds funny, but that's exactly how I thought. And so what I came to understand to be true, everybody, was that none of us as stewards of property of any kind are victims. We're just not. We're absolutely not victims of anything. If something gets sent our way, then then there's a way to manage around it or control it. Um, think of the bugs. I started asking myself, why are bugs showing up on my alfalfa fields? Is it just random? If it's just random, how come there's not bugs up on the hill? That, that Mother Nature manages? How come there's not pinholes in all those leaves? And there again, if, if, if nature is random, why aren't there strawberries growing just abundantly and wild on the side of the road bank and out of the manure pile? Why isn't, why isn't there anything uh, luscious and beautiful growing out of that, that kind of environment if it's random? So obviously it's not random. So there has to be a reason. So what I learned was that that all these things that we view as agriculturalists as problems short of a, a typhoon or a hurricane is simply nature's way to to indicate to us that there's an issue that there's a problem now this is super hard to understand i was i was at a, a appointment i own a company called living soils management probably should have started with that uh i go out to people's places and i i help them understand uh, different ways of thinking about their land. And I was at, at a gentleman's farm yesterday and I shared this with him. And he says, he says, well, what about weeds? And I says, I'm glad you asked. I said, uh, weeds are very similar to bugs. Nature sends these different things to us for a reason. And he says, how do you mean? I says, do you ever see, and we were standing in one of his fields, he's uh, planning on planting alfalfa in. And he had uh, similar hills to this up above his property. And I said, do you ever see weed infestations up there? And he, he looked at me kind of funny and he said, well, as a matter of fact, I don't. I don't see it. The only time I ever see weeds is down here on the bottom where we're always at. I said, why do you think that is? And he says, I don't know. And I call weeds, you guys, I call them nature's paramedics. So nature's nature is sending a paramedic oh my. to to this ground. Getting some 
And so uh, one interesting thing is that different plants do different things. Their job is different everywhere, everywhere that we look. And certain, certain weeds will tell you there's some books. There's a, uh, what we, when weeds talk and, and some different books like this, I'd recommend reading all that you can about weeds, but these weeds are not, are not your problem. And that sounds super, super controversial, but it's actually not. It's true. Weeds are simply sent to a location to fix a problem. So imagine, and, and for those of you calling BS on me out there, that's fine. That's fair. But let's, let's play a little bit of a game. Let's take every human being off of the planet for 150 years. Okay, let's just do that. Let's, let's take every single human, all the machines shut off, everything shuts off for 150 years, all right? And we come back in our little time portal to Earth. What does Earth look like? Is it a giant thistle patch? Is it, is it filled with mustard and kosher? And, and all, is everything starving to death because all there is is weeds? So a lot of people, they'd say, well, sure, they must be. There's nobody to spray them. But I'd submit to you that it's very, very different. What we would come back to was a lush, beautiful, thriving, ecological wonderland where there was multi-species everywhere and the, the topsoil would be deep. Now, so what that teaches me is it teaches me that nature, nature's not trying to kill us. Nature's not out to, to, to tear us down. Nature's actually chasing health. If that, if that statement at all is true, then nature is chasing health. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that nature, when he sends, when, when the God of nature is sending uh, these, these different, uh, uh, say, weeds or bugs to us, it's a merciful thing. He's basically saying, hey, something's wrong here. There's, a, there's an issue here. But in our chemical-focused, uh, chemistry-focused world, because we're really good at chemistry as humans, we say, we say, oh, there's a problem. Uh, but what I say is, is a problem is, is, is just a symptom of a bigger problem. And a lot of people don't realize that. They can't get past that, that what we're seeing is simply a symptom, you know? And so what I am trying to do here on this talk is I'm trying to explain to you guys how to unlock nature's potential using zero chemical inputs. And uh, I, I say this because uh, I know it's possible, not because I've studied that it's true, because I've lived that it's true. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. So what we were able to do here in Grace, Idaho, was be able to change the way we think about this. If nature's chasing health, that means I need to mimic it as quickly as I can, but we also have technology. So how can I use my big brain and opposable thumbs and technology to be able to, to speed up ecological time? Because if nature is chasing health, then, but she doesn't have a timeline. So all I'm saying is, okay, in 150 years without anything, this would be a, a, an Eden, a wonderland. But I don't have 150 years to spend on this property. So what do I do? I got to speed it up. So we have we have the blessing of, of diesel powered machines that can that can do tremendous amounts of work. Just a couple teaspoons of diesel can do more work than a man can in a, in a month. Uh, we have we have the ability to to mine minerals. We have the ability to process fish. We have the ability to do all these amazing things. And what we can do is we can speed up ecological time in doing so. So I believe in using technology to speed up that ecological time because all of us need, as Alan just mentioned, we all need to be making a profit. We don't have time to wait around and hopefully in 20 years, this is gonna turn around. And so what I started doing there in Grace, I started to see some results uh, that looked, some of our earliest results was this picture right here. So this, this is a picture that I took. This is one of the earliest examples of forage production using zero chemicals of any kind, uh, using no synthetic fertilizer of any kind. And simply, so this was very early on in the journey. And right here, this picture was taken uh, simply not killing the microbes in the soil. 
that were already there, which were meager, but they were there. And so I thought, okay, if I can do anything I can not to kill what's in the ground, I'll have success. And so this was an early example of success. So this crop right here took about uh, 50 days to grow. Uh, we brought in cattle and I was, a, I was, I owned a hay company at the time and we would ship all this hay out to dairies and, and feedlots all over uh, Idaho, uh, Utah and California. But uh, when we started getting results like this, I started saying, okay, so how do we, how do we improve this? How do we, how do we move this to the next level? And so I started, I started uh, making multi-species decisions and I started adding different grasses, different forbs, different legumes, different things like this to be able to get some of these results. And so I started growing these forages that were so diverse, self-fertilizing, and, and uh, so many different roots in the ground. I would also grow root vegetables at the same time in and amongst all this forage. I was growing this tremendous bank of forage. And I started thinking, okay, so what do I need to do to like push this. I thought this is incredible. I didn't even know that crops could grow this big. And so I thought, what, what is this crop's potential? And I started growing different crops and trying different things. And I thought, okay, if I can simply not kill the soil, we'll start there and got some results. Well, what if we feed the soil? What if we actively use this technology and some of these inputs to, to, to wake the soil up? to make it grow and to, to allow the living things in the ground to feed the plants instead of me relying on feeding the plants. And I studied on that quite a bit. And then I thought, well, what's the potential? That's a pretty heavy question, you guys. If you start asking yourself, what's the potential? You know, that's a little bit soul searching. I don't, I don't know what uh, the potential is. I know the God of nature does. But so I started to say, well, well, what is it? Let's push it. Let's see. Let's let's not only not kill the microbes in the soil, but let's re-inoculate with more strains of microbes. And I and and I and I had 18 different input salesmen coming over every other day trying to sell me different inputs and different things and and different products and and this will solve your problem. And this product right here will, will, will fix everything for you. And adding this product will give you gross margin. And ad adding that product was, will add your gross margin. And so my head started to explode, as it does. Because at that point, I was growing. And I had quite a few acres. And I had quite a bit of hay. And I was shipping all over, all over the country at that time. And exporting a lot of feed overseas. And I just thought... Uh, man, these product guys, they're driving me nuts. And so I thought, you know, I, I can't, I can't focus on products. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on process. So to this day, I, I call myself a process guy, not a product guy. And so, uh, and so what, what the process that I understood I needed to, to propagate was a living, living microbes in the ground, making sure to feed those microbes, don't kill the microbes, and plant as diverse a species of crops as I could and push the push the potential. And so then after a while, I was making alfalfa with leaves that look like this. You know, most most alfalfa leaves out there will barely cover your little pinky finger, let alone be that big or, you know, this big. You go ahead and hit the play button on that so it's full screen, Josh. There we are. Thank you. How do I make the slides go to the next one? Uh, I think you just hit the space bar or the forward arrow. Try it and see. Forward and back arrow should get you forward and back. Oh, that gotcha. Way. All right. Does that make well, sense? Can... So, yeah, and then you got about half an hour. Josh, you're doing great. Gotcha. Okay. So we started, we started, uh, when we started seeing alfalfa leaves like this, then we started breaking yield records. Uh, historical historical crop yields, uh, primarily alfalfa in the region I was in, was 3.8 ton per acre per year. We got to where we were cutting 6.5 ton of alfalfa per acre per year in that area. And then I leased a big farm uh, about 1,000 feet lower, uh, 55 miles away. And proven yields there were 4.8 ton per year. Uh, and after year one, 
uh, we were cutting 7.2 ton of alfalfa per acre per year. And then the next year was 8.1 ton of alfalfa uh, per acre per year. And all we did was focus on the microbe. Uh, it wasn't a it wasn't a product uh, that solved all our problems. It wasn't uh, it wasn't anything magic. What I tell people all the time is they're very very simple solutions to to almost every problem, but they're not necessarily easy. So to so to take it to the next level, uh, for 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 grazing, for range management, for irrigated crop management, for dry land management. It's the same story because I believe it's the same system. The same designer designed it all, right? And so the same system needs to work everywhere. There's there's microbes that that are in the ground that need to feed the roots of our plants that makes our plants nutrient dense and then makes the consumers enjoy those nutrients and receive health themselves. But it all starts at the very base level. And it's my belief that, that common agricultural discussion on forums like this and in other areas all over the internet and at different conferences, they set a baseline understanding of what farming is all about based on assuming that the soil is dead. And they'll make comments like, soft rock phosphate won't break down in your soil for 100 years. Okay, if the soil's dead, that's for sure true. But with a thriving microbial population and a rocking and rolling system, man, you'll see you'll see nutrient uptake from that soft rock phosphate right away. You really will. Proof's in the pudding. I did it for over a decade, 15 years. And I have farms in Nebraska, Wyoming, Utah, all over the West that are doing the very same thing. And so when we get out of the mindset of understanding what, what what we're being fed by people with that baseline understanding that, hey, for sure the soil's already dead. So this is how you farm in it regeneratively. <laughs> you know, it's a little, little bit of an oxymoron, but I see it a lot because, you know, and maybe people have profit motives with their products, which is understandable. Uh, but in my opinion, we have to walk before, we, you know, before we can run. And if we if we had a, a leg that got cut off, we're not going to be too worried about how much vitamin D we're getting, right? It's a triage situation. But so many farmers and ranchers that I talk to, they they say they say, ah, you know, we just we're just having like uh, potato guys, corn guys in the Midwest, um, soybean guys. I hear uh, alfalfa guys even in the South. I'll hear them. Ah, we got a boron problem. We got a, we got a, we got a coal, we got major cobalt issues, man. We have, uh, we have a sulfur issue and, and they'll, they'll talk like that because, but in my opinion, based on my experience over the last 18 years now is, is we, we got to walk before we can run. And are there microbes in the ground? How deep can they live? How deep is the aerobic zone of, of that soil? Let's start there. Let's start there. A lot of people, uh, they they say, well, we have to use a whole ton of irrigation in this place and we can't water very many acres because we need so much irrigation. And I'll say, how come? And they'll say, because how, do, how are we going to push nutrients to our roots without it? I'll say, okay, well, that's called nutrient solubilization, right? Because water is a very good solvent. But what I'm telling you is there's more than one way that nutrients get in the root of a plant. There's called microbial translocation. These little microbes, their job is to get down under the ground to, to populate as quickly as they can and to have a symbiotic relationship with the root. So they'll chew up chemical bonds between all sorts of different compounds in the soil and wherever they can live, where they have air, and they have a place to live and something to eat, they're gonna, they're gonna always work. They work for free. They're very efficient. And they'll they'll actually physically move nutrients from where they are, break these chemical bonds apart, and feed the root, whatever these, whatever these compounds may be. And so what I found is that certain soil tests that show an abundance, an abundance of a certain nutrient, the the, the plant absolutely lacks that nutrient because there's no microbes in the ground chewing those chemical bonds apart and giving bite-sized pieces of that nutrient to the plant root. 
happens all the time. And so a lot of these, a lot of these people that will try to give you recommendations based on whatever, uh, let's, let's always pay attention to the fact that usually, because it's true almost everywhere, that dead soil is the norm. I mean, obviously, 280 million pounds of glyphosate is added to our, our farm fields every single year on 298 million acres in just the United States. Okay, the the National Laboratory of Medicine has has viewed Roundup and glyphosate has studied them to provide mitochondrial dysfunction in the human body, to provide neuroinflammation in the human body. Okay, and that's not uh, that's not a, a a hippie saying that. That's not a that's not somebody that's just anti glyphosate for the sake of being it. That's the National Laboratory of Medicine concluding these things. The EPA has, has stated also that 46 million pounds of 2,4-D is put down on our ground every single year. Now, a lot of these different chemicals, products, uh, inputs, a lot of them are very, very antimicrobial. And if you think about this from a business standpoint, super smart. So it's kind of like, let me let me break the heel of your boot off and then charge you to glue it back on. Similar deal. A lot of these uh, companies are providing a way that you see results out of your farm fields. Because if you think about this, you want to see results, obviously. But if you also want to see results out of a two-year-old, you know what you can do? You can give them four Twinkies, two Mountain Dews, and a Red Bull. I promise if you do that, you'll see instant results. That little two-year-old will bounce off the walls. You'll see immediate results. But is that a good long-term solution? Obviously not. Horrible idea. But this is exactly what we do on our farm ground. We, we provide chemical inputs that are just like caffeine, heavy, heavy sugar caffeine inputs to this ground. And these, these crops shoot up, but while they're shooting up, they're sick because they don't have uh, microbiology feeding them the proper nutrients. And so they're very, very lacking. Even though they express activity, they're lacking. And so when the God of nature sees a crop lacking, in its infinite wisdom, the Mother Nature sends weeds and bugs to tear that sick stuff down and be able to, to restart, to be able to pull that carbon back down to the earth to be able to get some microbial activity so we can actually grow something healthy. It's very, very interesting how it works. But because, uh, because of our big brains and opposable thumbs, we figure out chemistry solutions to be able to push off nature's paramedics long enough to eke out a, a crop, and then that crop dies, and then we go and harvest the grain. It's interesting to me that ever since we started farming this way, that uh, gluten allergies have been on the rise, that uh, systemic diseases have popped up right and left. How come a panini that you eat in Europe tastes better than a flatbread that you eat in the United States? How come you feel better after you're done eating it? Have you ever thought of that? I've had that exact experience. And in my opinion, it's because there's not nutrients in our crops, therefore there's not nutrients in our food. Have you ever looked at a water bottle that you purchase at the store? If you purchase a water bottle from the store, look on the label, look back on the label, what will it tell you? Almost invariably, it'll tell you minerals added for taste. Isn't that strange? Minerals added for taste, for flavor. And so doesn't that mean that, uh, that if minerals are added for flavor there, wouldn't minerals be necessary for an abundance of flavor elsewhere. I would su submit to you that, that it absolutely would. In 1910, one bowl of spinach had the same nutrient density as 11 bowls of spinach today. There's not very many minerals, not very many nutrients in our food today. There's very little. Uh, we all need salt to get by some of our meals. We all need some, some Worcestershire sauce or some barbecue sauce or some ketchup or mustard or mayonnaise. We, we need these, these things to make sure that our food tastes good. 
I'd submit to you if you had a nutrient dense and 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 packed piece of of beef, uh, a vegetable, it would satiate you. You wouldn't be hungry for very long, and it would fill your body with vitality. I don't believe that health is a lack of sickness. I have a friend. He's he's hilarious. He's a, a dental hygienist, and he drinks almost nothing but Mountain Dew, and he eats the the most garbage food you can think of. Uh, 7-Eleven, you know, tacos and the whole thing. And he he doesn't get sick very often. He says, oh man, I'm healthy. Why are you such a nut? He says, I'm healthy. And after conversing with him, I've decided <laughs> that health is not a lack of sickness. Health is actually a presence of vitality. And I believe that that is true. And so if health is is a presence of vitality, and if the natural world is actually alive and it stands to reason that we want it to be healthy, then it comes full circle back to our soil. And we need to ask the question, what do we need to do to make this soil as healthy, vital, and operable as we possibly can? And my answer again is simple. Make sure that there's microbes, a vast array and diverse amount of microbes in the ground. Make sure that more than one crop species is grown in that ground. And make sure those microbes have a place to eat, place or a, a food to eat, a place to live, and air to breathe. And then the most important thing that sounds obvious, but it's not, we don't kill that microbial population. We're very, very good at understanding, hey, we... We, we like the idea of soil microbiology, but then we immediately kill it. Through, I mean, sometimes we don't know that we do. Soil compaction, too much grazing, uh, uh, too much tillage, you know, all these things. We can, we can start a good thing and then kill it. But if we just keep that living cycle growing and rolling, then you can start seeing some results uh, like what I'm showing you. But it doesn't take very long, you guys. Uh, one of my clients out in uh, Nebraska, he was he was kind of doing a gotcha thing with me. He's like, OK, tell me what you think about this soil right here. And I, I looked in and there was there was microbes there. The soil was kind of dark. You know, it, it looked like it. And then below it was, you know, it was quite poor. There was a, a hard pan layer down below. But there were some roots able to get down through. And, and I says, yeah, man, this uh, this is coming along. There's some life here. And he says, well, I got you there. Cause he's, he's, he's always pushing me and stuff. And he says, this farm was farmed conventionally for 15 years. And I says, okay, what happened in the last two? He says, well, he kind of looked down at his shoes. He says, we put five ton of compost down per acre and we haven't, we haven't tilled in a while. And, you know, and I says, well, that's an excellent lesson. Nature has an immune system. It's my belief that your farm can be, or your ranch can be really far gone, but it does not take very long to turn it around. You remember that farm I told you that I leased that was a, a, a thousand feet lower than the farm that I showed you pictures of? That uh, the, the hay yields went from 4.8 ton to 7.2 to 8.1. Remember that farm? A chemical representative that reps the chemical companies own that place. His favorite, his favorite tool was his sprayer. And he he was a chemistry fanatic. God bless the guy. Loved his job. And he would run chemicals over everything. And he he hardly ever talked about crops. He always talked about what was the next synthetic chemical he was going to put down. His farm was a parking lot. Bugs everywhere, weeds everywhere. And he was so happy because he could go kill his weeds with his sprays and alternate sprays for the chemical resistant strains. And, and finally, he wasn't making any money on his hay and forage, and he leased the whole thing to me. So 4.8 ton to 7.2 was one year. Nature has an immune system. There's a reason that crops that you spray chemicals on in the spring you know, towards later in the summer and in the fall, they start looking better again, you know, 
because nature has has things that break down. There's a half life to everything, and nature sends microbes to be able to break stuff down and decompose these these harmful these harmful compounds and chemicals and break them down. And so there is a little bit of microbial activity that can start happening even in these chemical farms, just as long as it's been some weeks and months since they've been killed. And so nature, nature is amazing and she can flip really, really quickly. All you have to do is show her a little bit of love. And so what I do is I, uh, I travel out to places. I identify what kind of weeds and bugs are there. Uh, I say, okay, this is what nature's trying to do. This is the symptom of a bigger problem. And whatever the symptom is determines what the problem usually is. And then we figure out what kind of technology we got to use, whether it's inputs or products. You know, some products are wonderful. They're not always the solution. Uh, what kind of tillage methods, what kind of grazing methods, what kind of crop choices, uh, just what kind of different various management ideas we have to implement uh, to be able to, to make change happen because change happens rapidly. Uh, consequently, as soon as that farm started making 8.1 tons to the acre, the owner of that farm became uh, super interested in ending the lease and taking the farm back. So I decided that this method of management is very, uh, very essential to get on as many acres as we can because I know for sure because I've seen it, we can break crop yield records by using inputs, using technology, uh, using, using smarter ways to manage our operations. We can make nutrient, very nutrient dense feed, food and fiber. And we could do all, all of it without the chemical man. I believe that this is a, a mission that needs to cover as many and touch as many acres on the earth as humanly possible. And so I slowed down actively farming my acres and now I'm completely committed to help as many people on as many acres as we can implement this kind of management because it's not just efficient, it's not just profitable, but it's necessary. I believe that, uh, that we don't need spray planes puffing poison over on our two-year-old girl's lawn that she's going to play on that day. I believe that nature has an immune system. I believe that we need to be more than just product people, but process people. I think if we do that and understand the method and nature of the God of nature, or the, the method and, uh, and the nature of how Mother Nature does it, it will help us to be able to manage our property in a very proper way. So uh, I'd encourage I'd encourage each one of you to to just think deeply about these things. Uh, think about what the potential on your place is. I don't think you've seen it yet. I know for sure I've never seen it. I I believe that alfalfa leaves can be bigger, corn can be taller, grasses can be thicker. Uh, I believe uh, that this world is a world of abundance. I actually have proof of that. Did you guys know? So 746 watts equals one horsepower. Did you know that our world is bathed in so much energy every single year that the potential for all of our agricultural production is absolutely bananas? On every square foot of your property, the sun produces 5,000 horsepower horsepower of energy per year. If you do the crazy weird nerd math like I've done before, that means 2.2 million gallons of diesel fuel worth of energy is provided to every single acre that you manage. Think of all that energy. Think of all that untapped potential. You know, and, and if we use our heads and we're smart marketers and we take the advice of Alan Crockett and build a really strong, solid business, then we can actually tap into these things and we can be excellent stewards of the land. We can, we can start to scratch the potential that's available at our fingertips and we can thrive uh, financially, ecologically, and in every other way. So I appreciate your participation. I appreciate you being here.
uh, to talk about the, the interconnectedness of this ecological world that we live on. Um, we're not just playing linear system whack-a-mole like conventional agriculture is so good at doing. Uh, we're stepping back and we're taking a wider, deeper view. So, Jared, from there, uh, I'll go ahead. Yeah. And, and, uh, Virtual round of applause. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Janet. Definitely standing ovation for Josh. Way, way to go. Um, yeah, very, very good. <clears throat> some questions, some thoughts, some just kind of wrap this up. You guys in, in the chat, go ahead. And, I want to hear what you learned that you can apply this year to your operation to make that jump in a regenerative direction. This was kind of like drinking from a fire hose and that's kind of kind of guy that Josh is. Um, he was a speaker on our podcast. You can check that out of the profitable steward, um, on, on YouTube and podcast channels. Um, learn a little bit more about what he does. But Josh, what is the best way to get a hold of you when these guys want to work with you? I know a couple of them have mentioned in the chat that they would like to. Yeah, um, you can. So please. Contact yeah. information. Yeah, absolutely, everyone. Living Soil Management on LinkedIn, or I have the email address livingsoilmgnt at gmail.com. So just management is shortened. Living Soil mgnt at gmail.com or living soul management on linkedin and you'll see you'll see me with probably a hat like this on and and uh, talking about crazy ideas so yeah i'm happy to work with people i i uh i'm happy to go out and uh, visit properties so if uh, you're on the chat today if you're uh, participating in this event uh, go ahead and send me a message on LinkedIn. Uh, type in the type in the info bar legacy, and we'll go ahead and and uh, offer our services for ten percent off uh, today, and be able to to help build these management plans on your place wherever it may be. So we actually I'm actually a pilot, so I I can I'm easily accessible. I can travel very quickly to a lot of places. So uh, yeah, we want you... to get around. Um... To like to start off with a good way to be to like jump on a zoom with you and kind of get to know you absolutely yeah so email me reach out to me explain to me your situation and uh if you're if you're a backyard gardener that it wouldn't make any sense to have me come to your place but we could absolutely schedule a, a meeting um a virtual meeting um and yeah. we'll just email everybody's situation is different there's nothing co cookie cutter about this deal <laughs> Um, but more than anything, I work for the mm -hmm. farmer. I'm not a product guy. I'm a process guy. And I suggest things that make money for you because you guys deserve you guys deserve the, the income. You guys deserve all the money uh, that you make from your hard labor. And so I work for you uh, when uh, when we come and we we produce these programs. I'm not uh, looking out for the chemical companies best interest. I'm looking out for you and your family and whatever goals you tell me that you have set for your place and yourself. That's what I keep in my mind when I make any kind of recommendations. I take that very seriously. And on that same note, if if I look at your place and you want me to come look at it and I don't feel like I could add add value and 10x uh, the amount of money that that we earn uh, by working with you, then I don't take the I don't take the job. I uh yeah. I'm only willing to work for you unless it's incredibly value add for you. I like That's a that. I make to everybody. Yeah, that is that is awesome. Um, I don't know. Casey was having some trouble getting uh, audio. Are you there, Casey? I know you've been out doing chores and stuff. Are you in a position where you can unmute. I just wanted to get a little context for your situation. Uh yes, I am. I don't yes. know how well you can hear me. Um, I'm in my tractor right now. Perfect. Um, what What did you find applicable from what Josh taught here today? Uh, man, I'm really, really amazed with uh, alfalfa and just seeing that, that quarter-sized leaf. <laughs> Never saw anything like that. And I know I've dealt with a lot of this stuff, um, but just knowing somebody else that does it 
and is also working with other farmers um, is really encouraging. Cool. And where are you from, Casey? Where, what's your... Uh, I'm out of North Dakota, Southeast North Dakota. And so you are producing, you're a forage producer? I do a little bit of hay, yeah, uh, alfalfa, just ditches, CRP. I got a small beaver. Okay. Um, yeah, and again, I want to acknowledge that you've uh, done your best to participate. Um, would you benefit from a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Josh, Casey? Well, I think so. Yeah, Josh, that's something we could help facilitate. Yeah, sure. That'd be just fine. I look forward to it. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, um, again, probably the best way, if you just want to share contact information in the chat here before we jump off. And then I did, I did drop maybe, um, okay. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Steven or Justine put in the LinkedIn. I also put in your uh, living soil mgnt at gmail.com. So those are the best ways to get a hold of Josh. Yep. Um, I guess Josh, you know, you're you are an entrepreneur. Um, I consider you to be somebody who's um just super passionate about what you do. Just switch gears here just a little bit and uh tell tell these people what it takes to be successful overall in business. Successful overall in business. So it's ironic because uh so I was at a trade show the other day and I have a, a sign that I put on the front of the booth that says, I've screwed up for 15 years, so you don't have to. And so I think that that's applicable because learning from the mistakes of others is way smarter than learning from your own mistakes. But if you have no other option, then learning from your own mistakes is the way you need to do it. Um, are you guys still there? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I just, I just unshared oh, okay. your screen so we can see you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so what I would tell you is uh, learn sound financial principles early. Uh, don't spend the money before you have the money. And uh, one, one principle, this is a very important principle, you guys, please, if you learn nothing else from what I say, learn from this, that we all talk about getting, we all talk about how we can increase our business and get and get and get and accomplish our goals and do what's best for me and and have my life be better. Well, you're saying me a lot, aren't you? So let's change this perspective a little bit, you guys. I promise in, in my experience of, of getting batted around a little bit in life, if we focus our energies outward and think about what we can provide, who we can serve, how we can give, I promise business will go better. Um, I look at money as simply service coupons. If you haven't collected enough money, it's because you haven't done enough service. If we serve our fellow man in a very efficient and effective way and provide value to them, money money will be the byproduct. And uh, so uh, I can't remember who said it, but they said, with all that getting, get understanding. That's not my quote. I, I can't reference it. But please get the understanding of and get financial acumen and then focus your energy on service. The more you serve, the more money you will make. If you don't have enough money, it's because you're not providing enough service. So if you want to make a lot of money, serve a lot of people. And, and that is a very, very uh, important principle that I'm quite passionate about. Beautiful. Very well articulated. Thank you, Josh, for sharing that. Um, yeah. And you're a living example of that providing service. And uh, so when I, <clears throat> I met Josh. We were actually both part of the Executive Link program, alum, the alumni program for Ranch Cheaper Profit. And um, I kind of watched what he did. And then I went and visited him and started that relationship. And um, it's just been really amazing to see the progress that he's made and the influence that he's had. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not because of something that he read in the book. And I know, yeah, Sean, thumbs up, you know, you, you're good friends with Josh as well. He's influenced a lot of young people and my boys included. They look up to you as a mentor. So thank you, Josh. Thank you very, very much for being here today. We appreciate it.